This 16-year-old high school student is in excellent systemic health and has just completed orthodontic treatment. His chief complaint is recession and tenderness of the gums around the left lower central incisor. All lower incisors are in labial version following the orthodontic therapy and the labial tissues covering the teeth are thin. At the bottom of the gingival cleft, the sulcus extends apically to the mucolabial fold. The distance from the cementoenamel junction to the free gingival margin at the cleft is six millimeters. Pull on the lip moves the free gingival margins associated with the cleft. A periodontal probe is used to outline the planned incision. The area has been anesthetized and the mesial free gingival margin is excised with a barred Parker number 12B knife. An attempt is made to excise all of the free gingiva to the bottom of the gingival crevice. A similar incision is made for the distal side of the cleft. These incisions extend into the alveolar mucosa. Then an incision is made around the apical border of the cleft excising the epithelial lining of the free gingiva. The excised tissues are removed with a curette and the cravicular areas are curetted to assure removal of all epithelium. surface is also curetted to remove surface accretions and to eliminate some of the labial protrusion of the root. The denudation of the root in the curetted area extends three millimeters apically to the mucolabial fold and nine millimeters apically to the cementoenamel junction. The second incision is outlined with a periodontal probe starting at the distal aspect of the cleft, extending into the gingival sulcus of the lateral incisor, over to the cuspid, and down vertically to the alveolar mucosa at the mesial buccal aspect of the cuspid, and with a slight releasing incision into the alveolar mucosa. A barred Parker number 12B knife is used for release of the split flap. The incision is made on the outer surface of the periosteum about a half a millimeter from the bone. A reverse bevel cravicular incision is made on the labial surface of the lateral incisor and extended through the interdental papilla over to the cuspid. A releasing vertical incision is made from the alveolar mucosa to the mesial aspect of the cuspid. This incision is extended two to three millimeters mesially into the alveolar mucosa.
The flap is dissected loose from underlying periosteum with a barred Parker number 12B blade. The flap is gently deflected from the line of incision with a blunt instrument to facilitate dissection from the periosteum with a minimal trauma to the flap. The dissection is extended through the zone of attached gingiva into the alveolar mucosa. When the flap is reflected, the periosteum on the surface of the bone is visible. The flap is immediately placed back to its original position and the mesial aspect of the cleft is inspected. The frenum attachment is excised with the barred Parker number 12B blade to avoid future frenum pull on the free gingiva. The flap is gently pulled laterally to cover the cleft. It adapts well to the surrounding tissues and can now be sutured in the new position. The suture needle is passed between the central incisors from the lingual to the labial side. Then the needle is passed through the mesial aspect of the flap. The flap is placed over the cleft and the suture needle is threaded back between the central incisors to the lingual side. Subsequently, the needle is threaded from the lingual to the buccal side between the lateral and central incisors. Since these teeth did not have a tight contact, the suture slipped up from the interproximal space. The distal aspect of the flap is then engaged by the needle and the suture placed between the lateral and central incisor so it can be tied on the lingual side of the tooth. The flap is held closely to the tooth with this suspended suture. Here another suture has been placed at the mesial border of the flap to hold it securely in the desired position. There is no lip pull on the flap. The knot of the suspended suture is shown on the lingual aspect of the tooth that had the labial cleft. In the preparation for a free gingival graft, a piece of tin foil of approximated size is placed over the surgical defect. The tin foil has been cut to fit the size of the defect. The tin foil is placed on the palatal mucosa in an area of no rugae. An incision is made along the borders of the tin foil with a barred Parker number 12B blade. This incision should extend through the mucosa and into the submucosa.
The graft is cut loose with an Orban knife. The graft should be thick enough to have a proper connective tissue base, but should not extend into the palatal fat pad, since fat tissue would not provide a good base for adhesion of the graft. The thickness of such a graft should be between one and one and a half millimeters. The graft should be dissected loose without any trauma and should be handled very carefully. The graft has been removed, and the surgical dressing is applied over the donor site. The dressing is locked interproximally between the teeth using a plastic instrument. The free graft is placed over the periosteal defect following the laterally positioned flap procedure. It has now been sutured to the distal wall of the surgical defect with five aught silk sutures. Both the free graft and the lateral sliding flap have been held in position for a couple of minutes with a piece of gauze moistened in sterile saline solution. It is important to have a viable periosteum under the free graft in order to get a take of the graft. Therefore, a split flap procedure was used during the laterally positioned flap procedure. It is also assumed that there is less resorption of the thin labial bone following a split flap procedure rather than a full flap procedure. Acromycin ointment is spread over the flaps and the sutures. Tin foil is adapted to the wound area and to the adjacent teeth. Surgical dressing is placed on the top of the tin foil and locked in between the teeth with a plastic instrument. The surface of the dressing is trimmed with the lip to assure full freedom of lip movements. A small piece of lingual dressing has been placed to provide full coverage of the sutures and to help hold the labial dressing in place. One week post-operatively, the dressing is removed. There is some debris on the wound surface. The sutures are carefully removed. After the wound has been cleaned by sterile saline solution, a new surgical dressing is placed over the area of surgery. The donor site in the palate has healed to the extent that a new dressing is not needed. Six weeks after the surgery, the donor site in the palate has healed completely. The aesthetic results at the site of surgery are excellent. Notice also that there is a shallow gingival crevice with a typical blanching when probing to the bottom of the crevice. The free gingival margin is approximately at the cemento enamel junction and the gingival sulcus is about one millimeter deep, both for the central and lateral incisors.